Okay, thank you. And so just as a reminder, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick kickoff. Uh, this is a set of seminars that we started in uh, October to address what we knew, what we know, what we'd like to know uh, about uh, PASC and, and post-acute sequelae of COVID. Um, we've had some really terrific uh, seminars uh, about what's been going on and what people have been finding. And uh, today, I, I'm kind of sad and happy to say that this is our last in the series. We're going to kind of wrap it up with this, but I think, you know, uh, we've saved one of the best for last. And so uh, what we're going to hear is from Dr. PJ Utz. Um, and before I pass over the baton to uh, our hosts, Dr. Rappaport and Fessel. I'm going to just remind everyone that the presentation is being recorded um, because we will both use this as a, uh, to, to, so others can see it after the, the meeting. Uh, it will be posted on our website. We are also turning this into some sort of a, a white paper that, uh, that we will include as a every, you know, uh, kind of what we know as we know it. Um, and the at attendees, uh, we would like you to stay muted during the uh, presentations. But if you have any Q&A, any questions, please put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom, which is down there shown a picture for those of you like me who always lose these things, uh, please just click on that. And we will monitor those closely to make sure that the questions get to Dr. Utz uh, either during this, the seminar, if it makes sense, or, or at the end. There will be a question and answer session at the end, and we do appreciate questions as you might expect. So um, please, uh, take notes of, of the questions you have and, and then let's get to them because quite frequently that's the most, that's an interesting part to hear what, what people are thinking and how it's, how it's heard. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to our hosts, Dr. Rappaport and Dr. Fessel, who will be doing the, um, the introduction of Dr. Hudson. Great, um, thank you very much. Uh, Joe, it, it's really been a pleasure, you know, working with uh, with, with Joe Manetsky and also um, my colleague Josh Fessel, who is uh, a program officer for um, uh, the um, NCATS, and uh, it's it's really been educational, been a great seminar series. I'd like to thank all of the previous speakers. We've learned so much, and this is going to be available on the web as, uh, we as we transcribe these. And I think it'll be a, a very good and growing resource. And hopefully perhaps in the future, uh, we'll have the opportunity to start these up again. Uh, so um, with that, um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Dr. P.J. Odds. It's, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce him. Uh, PJ is, is a physician scientist in immunology and rheumatology, and actually the Hawaiian shirt that he's wearing is emblematic of that, that all the physician scientists over there at Stanford, uh, he's given them out to all those, and there's a lot of them running around. Uh, he, he trained in his clinical internship and residency in medicine and his clinical fellowship in immunology and rheumatology at Brigham and Women's. Um, and he's been back at Stanford uh, you know, uh, for more than 20 years, now a prof professor of medicine. He's a founder and director of the Stanford Institute of Medical Research, which is the largest high school research program dedicated to improving diversity of our nation's bioscience and physician scientist workforce. And his research is focused in, in providing, provided uh, leading discoveries um, in the clinical immune system disorders, uh, infections and autoimmune diseases such as uh, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, scleroderma, MS, uh, IBD, and others. Uh, he's received numerous honors and awards in teaching and research and extremely well published in first-rate journals, 
and highly funded by the NIH and foundation uh, support on numerous projects. And we're very pleased to welcome uh, PJ to present his work here uh, in our PASC series, our, our final uh, seminar for this series entitled Autoantibodies and COVID and Other Infectious Diseases. Excellent, thanks. So to share my screen, I think I need uh, permission. So it says I cannot share until someone stops screen. So let me try again, see if this works. Be able to see that? Yes, we can, Dr. O. Yeah, just having just having a hard time now figuring out how to how to get it so that I can show the whole thing. If you go up to the slideshow tab towards the center right below the search bar. Yeah, unfortunately the search bar, it's not letting me do that. Um, because the search bar is in the way. Terrible, I don't think I've had this happen before. Hmm. Yeah, so it's blocked, so I'm not able to do it. That is crazy. Um, if you make your window smaller, yeah, there you go. Maybe. Yeah, yeah there we go. Perfect. All right. Well, you got to be a professor at Stanford. That's how you get to be a professor, I guess, is you can ultimately figure these things out on the fly. So, so I, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm really excited about this and have been very excited about this area now for really since the pandemic started, but even going before that, I've been long interested in things like molecular mimicry and, and how autoimmune uh, diseases start to begin with. I'm going to start off by just um, stating my conflicts of interest, which are shown here. So I'm on several SABs and have sponsored research from some companies. Uh, I own some stock in some companies that are making products related to uh, SARS-CoV-2. None of this is really going to be relevant, to be honest, but I disclose it nonetheless. I will also note that I'm, I'm very actively involved in Recover, which is the long COVID uh, consortium that NIH uh, is building, and I'm the vice chair for immunology and hematology. So I'm trying to work with Jim Heath and, and Akiko and other people who were listed on your previous slides to try to drive the immunology that we're going to do within this uh, huge recovery uh, effort. Prior to this, of uh, relevant to the FNIH, I was also, uh, I ran the leadership center for the AMP RA lupus program for seven years, and that's now winding up. So I'm transitioning over to recover. So I'm, I'm going to just start off by sort of giving you the backstory of why we got interested in this to begin with. And, and the, the pandemic hit um, in full force in February of, God, it seems like forever, February of 2020, probably. And uh, I had just come from a National Academy of Medicine meeting where we were talking about physician scientists and how big the problem was. And then sure enough, everything gets shut down soon after that. So our lab shut down here on campus. And um, I started, and I was not actively seeing patients um, except at the VA. And so I wasn't seeing any COVID patients at all, but I was hearing about uh, COVID manifestations and autoimmune type manifestations from some of my colleagues who had reported that they were seeing patients who had new onset severe arthralgias. Uh, give me one second here. I'm gonna make my, um, uh, where's this? my pointer, pointer options. So, um, they were reporting that they were seeing patients who had severe arthralgia soon after starting, uh, soon after getting uh, infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. We had several people here who developed full-blown new onset um, seropositive rheumatoid arthritis within a week uh, to 10 days of getting infected. Uh, other manifestations were being um, described, myalgias, myositis, myocarditis, which has also been observed with the vaccine. And then of course, some of the bigger ones, things like vasculitis and thrombosis. And so hearing all of this, uh, my lab started getting really excited because we thought, well, this virus has something about it um, that is, appears to be triggering what could be new onset autoimmune diseases. And so one of the ways we were able to reopen our lab was to start studying COVID-19. And so we decided we were gonna study autoantibodies in particular 
and I'll introduce this in a minute, but my, my lab going back 20 years has been um, developing protein microarrays for studying autoantibodies. And so um, some of these papers came out uh, that suggested that patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection, especially if they had severe infections, were developing autoantibodies. The first report was from this group in Greece in which they showed that about a third of patients who were hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 had anti-nuclear antibodies. And um, many of these were in a nucleolar pattern. And a uh, nucleolar pattern is often seen in patients who have systemic sclerosis. It's not a common pattern to see. They also found that about 14% um, uh, had uh, ANCA-associated vascular uh, uh, antibodies. These are things like proteinase 3 and myeloperoxidase. Uh, and then 40% had antiphospholipid antibodies that are associated with clotting. Now, what they didn't talk about in this paper uh, in much detail was whether the, the patients actually had the manifestations of the autoimmune diseases that you might expect to see if you had these autoantibodies. Same thing uh, happened with a paper uh, from uh, Gruber. Gruber published a really nice paper in MIS-C looking using a phage display approach, and they identified antibodies against the, the LA protein. Um, uh, Inaki Sands Group published a paper in Mad Archives uh, in 2020 showing um, about 40 to 50% of patients had anti-nuclear antibodies, and they tended to be pretty high titer. And then Aaron Ring's lab published a, a really elegant study, as did uh, um, Jean-Laurent Casanova, and I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, uh, that there are multiple secreted proteins that are uh, targets of the auto uh, antibodies in patients with SARS-CoV-2. So taken together, this really suggested that this virus was at least associated with autoantibodies. Whether they were triggering these antibodies as new autoantibodies uh, was not clear from these studies. These are really observational cross-sectional at this point. Now, one of the, the most interesting studies that came out uh, relatively early on was this uh, paper by Jason Knight. They've had uh, several follow-on papers. Uh, and what they did here was they looked at patients who had a severe SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they just looked for antiphospholipid antibodies uh, by ELISA, so IgG, IgM, IgA. Large number of patients, 172 of them, and about half of them had at least one of these autoantibodies. But again, most of the patients did not have evidence for active um, severe clots like DBTs or pulmonary emboli, but nevertheless, a very large proportion. Um, in this paper, they went on to show that these antibodies are actually pathogenic. Uh, they cause the, uh, the formation of neutrophil extracellular traps. It's a, me a mechanism by which neutrophils die in, in, in a very inflammatory way, and that these actually can cause clots. And so you're, you're uh, probably familiar with Nick Cordero's story. Um, he uh, died from um, very bad SARS-CoV-2 infection, complicated by multiple clots, uh, amputations, and so forth. So what uh, Jason's group showed was that if you took uh, purified IgG from patients who had SARS-CoV-2 in infection versus control, if you take control IgG and just add it to neutrophils, you can see that the cells all look pretty normal see a nice intact nucleus. But if you do this with samples from patients who have SARS-CoV-2, the IgG, the neutrophils explode and the, the extracellular traps are released. It's like a spider web with lots of inflammatory um, uh, peptides in it and histones, which themselves have antimicrobial properties. Uh, and these serve as uh, uh, sites of, um, of inflammation or act activating uh, inflammatory pathways. They then went on and showed in vitro, uh, in, I'm sorry, both in vivo and in vitro, that these, are, these antibodies are pathogenic. And so what they did was they purified antibodies from uh, patients who had catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is often associated with lupus, not often, but it is associated with lupus. And for those of you who have seen it, it's just absolutely horrific. These patients clot everywhere, necrosis, uh, necrosing off limbs, it's just horrible. So if you purify the IgG from uh, patients with, um, with uh, catastrophic antiphospholipid antibodies, and then you transfer them into a mouse, and that mouse has had uh, electrolytic uh, electrolysis of its inferior vena cava, which serves as a nidus for clots. Um, and then you look, I think they did this at one or two days later, and you look at the IVC, there are these huge clots if you have catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, IgG. 
control very small clots. If you take patients with high, uh, very high levels of antiphospholipid antibodies, they also clot. The ones with lower levels have lower levels of clot. So this tells you that, that um, these antibodies do appear to be pathogenic and can directly cause clotting in, an, in this model. It also tells you that depending on the levels of these antibodies, you can have varying degrees of clots. And again, this is in a large vessel. Um, one of the things with PASS that, that we're all wondering about is whether there's a lot of microvascular uh, clotting that's going on that could go on for many months or even years after the infection that could be playing a role in, in um, long COVID. They then took these clots and they eluded out what was inside them. And what they found was that there were, um, there were uh, antibodies, complexes between the antibodies and myeloperoxidase and DNA. In other words, uh, the, the material from these neutrophil extracellular traps could actually be found in the clots and suggested that that was driving this whole process. So I just showed this as one example of the many different autoantibodies that people are studying now to try to understand uh, which of these antibodies might just be diagnostic markers and which of them could be directly pathogenic. And that's something that we will hopefully learn in the next three to four years in the recover program as we study these uh, tens of thousands of patients who are being enrolled. Um, so my lab then went on and did a study that was published in Nature Communication uh, this past fall. Uh, this was the most challenging study I think that my lab has uh, ever done because we had limited funding to do it. We had all kinds of controls on what we could and could not do in the lab. We had supply chain issues, um, but it was a tour de force of about 50 authors. It was really led by um, three of us as PIs, myself, Nina Luning Prock, who is at Penn, uh, and Chrysanthi Skivaki in Marburg, and uh, these scientists that are shown here from Stanford uh, and Penn in particular. So what we did was we collected samples from patients with COVID, and, and all of the data that I'm going to show you now uh, was, is on samples that were collected in March and April of 2020. So this would be the original Wuhan variant, no vaccines. Uh, and for the initial samples that we ran, we had no clinical data at all. These were discard samples that uh, took us a while to even get a biosafety protocol together to be able to study them. So we had all of these different samples to study. In the interval period now, we have studied about 800 samples from um, SARS-CoV-2. Some of them had longitudinal samples, meaning we had samples that were collected at the time they were, soon after they were infected, and then we had serial time points after that to see what happened. Were some of these antibodies um, inducible? Were some of them transient? Uh, and so forth. And I won't talk about this. I'll show one slide on this interferon lambda trial. Um, but, but this was a, a really neat trial that was uh, done by Upi Singh and, and Pras Jagannathan. Uh, where PEG interferon was given to the patients with very new onset within five days of their positive PCR test. And, and this, um, this cohort has allowed us to now look um, at what happens like very close to the time of infection. That's one of the drawbacks that I'll tell you about. So going into this too, I'll also tell you that some of the, some of the drawbacks. Um, one is that the healthy controls that we had are not age or sex matched. And so uh, we're in the process now of trying to really do that more rigorously. And I say that because many patients who are hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2, especially early on, were elderly. Elderly patients are more likely to have autoantibodies. So that's something in the back of our minds we're always thinking about. Yeah, you have these antibodies, is it due to the virus or is it due to the patient just being older and developing antibodies as they get older? Um, and the second was that we don't have true time point day zero time points, meaning uh, a point that predated when they were infected. Um, all of the data that I'll show you where we do have longitudinal samples were typically collected uh, within a day of their admission to the hospital. So at that point, they could have been infected for days or even a few weeks. The first thing that we did was we just asked a simple question, do we find anti-nuclear antibodies in these patients? And so this was done in a CLIA certified lab at Penn by Nina and Wen Zhao. And uh, what they did was they took samples uh, as uh, focusing on samples where we had two time points as well. And uh, they just screened them using a traditional anti-nuclear antibody assay where cells are affixed to a glass microscope slide. They are permeabilized, stained with antibodies from serum from the patients, um, titered, and then uh, washed 
and uh, the any bound antibody is detected using a secondary antibody. And what you see is that yes, about a quarter of the patients had at least one autoantibody, um, or at least one. Um, eat, I'm sorry, each patient uh, that was screened, we where we did the ANA, we found that about 25% had a positive ANA test, at, and at least um, one of the two time points. And we saw uh, widely differing patterns. So we saw a homogeneous pattern, which is pretty nonspecific. You see this with uh, patients as they get older. Nucleolar pattern shown here, which is really atypical. Uh, and then this speckled pattern, which is what you might expect with patients who have antibodies against RNA binding proteins in particular. So unlike what was seen in the literature, we weren't seeing a huge number of patients who had positive anti-nuclear antibody tests. It was roughly about a quarter. We also looked, uh, again, using CLIA certified assays for double-stranded DNA antibodies, antibodies against myeloperoxidase and antibodies against protonase three. Uh, it's definitely been observed in patients with severe SARS-CoV-2 that they can develop um, vasculitis, which is associated with these ANCA-associated antigens, myeloperoxidase and PR3. And unlike what was seen in the, the literature, we had almost none of the patients had positive tests. We had one patient who was PR3 positive. We had no clinical data on this patient, so we don't know if they even had vasculitis. None of them were positive for double-stranded DNA antibodies either. Uh, and you can see that we had uh, robust reactivity to um, RBD and to nucleocapsid in these patients, as you, as you would expect. So the point here is that if we were to be screening patients using just traditional ELISAs and CLIA-certified assays, we probably wouldn't pick up whatever these antigens are that are being targeted. And this is reflected in other people's work as well. Um, I presented in a, an NIH, uh, FNIH um, funded two-day symposium that uh, Tony Fauci organized in December of 2020 on long COVID. It was a, a really phenomenal uh, two-day presentation. If you don't haven't had a chance, uh, it's definitely worth going back and seeing some of the patient descriptions of what they were going through, the brain fog and the uh, POTS, um, postural ortho, uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and, and other things that they went through or were going through. It's really, um, it, it's really striking. And Judith James presented there. She's uh, one of the world's um, best autoantibody experts. And they've done these CLIA certified assays and again found that about 15% of patients have at least one autoantibody, but not a whole lot of the things that you would ordinarily um, see. And moreover, um, not a lot in the way of um, antibodies against uh, phospholipids, the clotting antibodies that Jason's Knight, uh, Jason Knight's lab had identified. So we then, uh, so the conclusions are, are shown here. Uh, common antigens are not particularly prominently targeted. About a quarter have an ANA. Many of them are low titer. So what are these patients recognizing? Um, so what we then decided to do was to develop um, autoantigen microarrays, and we had we've been doing this for many years and use them to characterize lots of different um, diseases: lupus, scleroderma, myositis, uh, tons of RA, lots of different diseases. Um, because of supply chain issues, we were forced to just make an array based on what we had in the lab. Uh, so we made a 73plex array, and I'll show you the how we came up with that content. For the purposes of a paper or talk, I could say it was all rational. And that, that's the case that I'm going to make. But it, the reality was it was pretty much what we had in the freezers that we could get locally. Uh, we also created a cytokine array. My lab has been working on anti-cytokine antibodies for uh, eight or nine years now. Uh, and we hypothesized that these patients may make antibodies against cytokines and growth factors. And of course, we were scooped by Jean Laurent's lab and then Aaron Ring's lab. Uh, but I'll show you the, the data that we did find. And then we also created a, uh, a viral array that uh, included um, many of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins that were available through uh, Peter Kim's lab, Taya Wong's lab, uh, but many other uh, infectious agents. Um, the, the method is pretty straightforward. We use the Luminex bead-based approach where each bead is barcoded. And we affix a different antigen to each of the individual bead uh, barcodes. These are then probed using um, serum from patients, but we've done this with other tish, uh, tissues and, and um, uh, fluids as well. Any bound antibody is then um, 
remains after washing and is detected using a secondary antibody conjugated to a fluorophore. We run it through the instrument and the readout is mean fluorescence intensity. Uh, this is what we, uh, as I said, the different antigens that I'll show you. Um, we, we, uh, some of these we ended up not finding um, were useful in the, in the array, so we, we pulled them out of the array. So I won't show you all of the data. And this is the rationale, at least for a talk like this, for why we selected these antigens. So this is what we found, and I'm just gonna, the paper has been published uh, and many of you have probably already seen it, um, but I'll just summarize what we found. Um, so uh, the way that we display the data is by calculating the mean fluorescence intensity for each antigen for the healthy controls. And then we calculated how many standard deviations uh, above the mean for healthy controls um, were, were found in the patients who had SARS-CoV-2 infections. We also used prototype sera from patients who had lupus, scleroderma, and so forth, uh, just to show that the arrays were working and we could detect at least half of the antigens this way. Over here are the cytokines, uh, anti-cytokine antibodies. I'll talk more about that later. But if you just focus here, what you can see is that about half of the patients that we studied who were all severely ill in the hospital had antibodies against at least one autoantigen and virtually none of the healthy controls. It was like maybe 5% of the healthy controls, the most common one being thyroperoxidase. We've now gone on and studied, as I said, closer to 800 um, from eight different centers uh, in multiple different um, places around the country and around the world. Um, and what we also found is that about three quarters of the patients had antibodies against at least one cytokine. Uh, in fact, they, they were much more prevalent as we'll, we'll go over later uh, in the patients with SARS-CoV-2 than the connective tissue disease uh, antigens. So what are these antigens that are being targeted? Well, one is uh, we found beta-2 glycoprotein-1. Without getting into the, de the details, this is a challenging antigen to work with in a Luminex bead-based assay because it's very hydrophobic. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of weight in this, but we did see, uh, and again, um, I need to explain this better, the y-axis is the MFI. So the, the, the brighter the signal, the, the higher the bar. These are the COVID patients. These are the healthies here and these are prototypes. So the healthies rarely have them. Same thing with antibodies against C1Q, but patients who have SARS-CoV-2 do have these antibodies. C1Q is an inhibitor, and what it does, this has been identified in patients with lupus who have very bad renal disease. In fact, it's a, a good marker for renal failure. And C1Q is involved with uh, removing uh, immune complexes that form. And so if you have antibodies against C1Q, the immune complexes stay around longer. And the thought is that then there's more inflammation. We also found relatively rare patients who had antibodies against ACE2. They did not seem to change over time, uh, but we found three or four such patients. We do not know if these antibodies actually would block and be natural uh, blockers of, um, of SARS-CoV-2 binding to ACE2. If they are, they didn't work very well because these are patients who got really sick. So what we did find that was um, very interesting to us is that many of the antigens that were targeted were found in rare connective tissue diseases, such as myositis, dermatomyositis or polymyositis. And um, a really interesting thing about um, myositis patients is there's been this long held hypothesis that patients who develop autoimmune myositis are triggered by some sort of a virus. And there have been cases of uh, patients who develop antibodies against signal recognition particle and full-blown myositis a week after acute influenza is just one example. These antigens are typically not in the nucleus. They're actually found in the cytoplasm. And so we found patients who had antibodies, even at the first time point, the zero time point and the seven-day time point to one of the tRNA synthetases called EJ, PL12, JO1, and PL7. All four of these are tRNA synthetases. And the antibodies are um, really strikingly high. These are, this isn't something that you would say, oh, that's kind of close to the cutoff. These are through the roof um, high levels and would be what you would see in a patient who actually has myositis with these antibodies. We also found antibodies uh, in, that would be associated with patients with scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. So again, these are the COVID samples, healthy controls, and then here are the prototypes. So here is a patient with um, scleroderma and anti-centromere antibodies. Uh, and you see that uh, several patients develop pretty new antibodies against centromere, not as high as what you would see, but 
still um, abnormal and uh, in the 20,000 range for MFI, which is again, very high. Several patients with SCL70 antibodies, which is found, uh, these are found in patients with um, uh, diffuse systemic sclerosis. And here's a prototype sample. So you can see the levels are pretty close to what you would see with full-blown systemic sclerosis. And I'm gonna you know, make the obvious thing that all of you are thinking about here, just put it out there. And the, the big question that we're going to have to understand with PASC is, are we now going to see this huge uh, increase? Are we gonna see an increase in the epidemiology studies of patients with scleroderma, myositis, and association with these particular antibodies, in which case it would suggest that the virus actually triggered um, that, uh, that finding. This is another example from the, the, uh, the uh, PEG interferon study that PROS and UPI did. And so we screen these patients at day zero. So this is, that's in blue. Uh, these are patients within five days of their positive PCR test, and then 28 days later. And I'll just show you one example. We have this very striking patient who had no antibodies against this antigen PMSCL75 but then 28 days later had whopping levels of the antibody. And so I, when I went back to PROS, I asked more about this patient. Can you just tell us more about this patient? And uh, when I told him the number, which is subject 108, he said, oh yeah, that was the sickest patient. He, he was admitted, went right to the ICU, intubated, almost died. And so what we found is that most of the patients who have these new antibodies are not the mild patients, but they're actually the patients who get severely ill. And I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna um, skip this because I'm gonna make the same point later when I get to the influenza study. But all I'll say here is that we, we were really, really interested in trying to determine whether these antibodies are newly formed or if they're already present at the time of infection and we're just picking them up because the patients have it, autoantibodies. And so what we did was we found uh, about a dozen patients where we had a day zero time point and a day seven time point and where the day zero time point had very low levels of RBD or nucleocapsid, but then at the later time point, the levels went up dramatically. And so you can see that here. So we assume that these are people who were infected relatively recently and had not even mounted a good uh, response to the virus yet. And we screened those for autoantibodies. And what you can see in these boxed areas are that we found that about a quarter of the patients who uh, were infected and did not have antibodies at baseline developed new autoantibodies at the day seven time point. And many of these patients continue to have those autoantibodies even at day 28. Um, some of the antigens that are targeted are shown here. The, the main ones that we're seeing reproducibly are myositis antigens like SRP54, beta tube glycoprotein 1, and then histones. So uh, conclusions here, the main target antigens we're seeing are found in rare diseases like scleroderma and myositis. Many of these antigens are associated with RNA or DNA. They're part of complexes. They're very highly conserved across species. And the thought here is that when they form an immune complex, the RNA that, could, that is in the complex can drive activation of cells even without requiring T cell help. So this could happen through toll-like receptors such as TLR7. And we know that this virus is an RNA virus. And so we're wondering whether the RNA from the virus may be activating through toll-like receptors and driving the production of autoantibodies and autoreactive B cells. So in the third part, let me just take you quickly through the anti-cytokine antibody work because this has uh, opened up an entirely new field. So um, the important take-home point here is that some infectious diseases are fundamentally not infectious diseases, they're autoimmune diseases. And COVID is not one of those diseases, but what I will show you is that if you have some of these anti-cytokine antibodies at baseline and you get infected with a virus that may not even be a particularly pathogenic virus, you may have much, much worse, out, worse outcomes because the antibodies are actually blocking binding to the receptor and preventing the immune system from doing what it needs to do. There are lots of these different anti-cytokine antibodies that have been described. Uh, and this is a review article from, from um, uh, Steve Holland's lab so for example, there's antibodies against erythropoietin that cause pure red cell aplasia and anti-interferon gamma antibodies um, here that cause disseminated uh, mycobacterial infections. So my lab has been working in this area for a while. We thought, well, if you're seeing these in infectious diseases, I wonder if you see them in autoimmune diseases like lupus, 
where some of those patients get really bizarre fungal infections. We, we don't really know why. And so I won't take you through the data. This is an old paper in JCI that we published showing that patients with lupus have antibodies against interferon alpha, um, other interferons, interleukin-2, and then antibodies against BAF, which is a B-cell growth factor. These are naturally occurring antibodies. And in this case, these antibodies were actually blocking antibodies. So the, the big paper that came out that I think really changed how we think about this was from Jean Laurent's group. Uh, and they looked at um, about a thousand or so, 700 to a thousand, I forget the number, but it was a lot of patients who had severe SARS-CoV-2. And what they found that was that about 12% of men and two to 3% of women who had severe disease had antibodies that blocked binding of interferon alpha to its receptor, IFNAR. Um, whereas if you had mild disease, none of those patients had those antibodies. And they've since revised those numbers. They, they have a more sensitive blocking assay. Uh, and the numbers are actually higher for severe disease and they are found in mild disease. And the thought process here is that if you don't have these antibodies, you get infected with the virus, you make interferon, interferon binds to IFNAR, and then activates the immune system and you have a better clinical outcome. But if you have these pre-existing antibodies, when you make interferon, it binds, uh, the antibodies bind to the interferon, prevent it from binding to IFNAR receptor and activating this genetic program, and the virus replicates much better. So that's the thought process. Um, so we, as well as Aaron Ring's lab, Aaron, um, Aaron's a superstar scientist at Yale, uh, trained in our MSTP when I was the MSTP director. So I'll take full credit for, for his success. But, but Aaron is a superstar and developed this method called REAP that allows him to look at three or 4,000 secreted proteins at a time. He found the same antibodies as well as others. So as I've already shown you, if you look at patients with severe SARS-CoV-2, about three quarters of them have these antibodies. Um, and then we look to see what happens over time. So are these antibodies already there? Do they change? Are they inducible? And so um, this is from the, the Nature Communications paper just presented a little bit differently. Red means these are antibodies that were absent at the first time point, but were present at a later time point. Blue means that they're there and they don't seem to change. And green shows that they're there and then they seem to go away, suggesting they, they're transient. And so for interferon epsilon, we pretty reproducibly have found patients who have absent antibodies and a week later they have very high antibodies. And, and same thing with IL-17A and IL-17F, IL-22. And so our thought there is that perhaps these patients are driving um, the production of these cytokines, which is leading to even more of the autoantibodies being made that are pre-existing. And it's possible that these might actually be playing a protective role. We don't really know. Is it possible that they're immunomodulatory? Could they be playing a role in PASC? We also don't know that. This is a really poignant example that does not have to happen early in hospitalization. So we found this patient who um, we, we only had a day 20 and a day 29 uh, time point. We didn't have a baseline time point. And at day 20, this patient had no antibodies against IL-22 and at day 29 had sky high levels. And um, IL-22 antibodies are usually blocking um, in these sorts of uh, studies. So um, that also has made us think, wow, even later in the course of a severe illness, or perhaps even during convalescence, um, some of these anti-cytokine antibody, antibodies may um, pop up that could in part be playing a role in why these patients develop some of these symptoms. Uh, an interesting paper has come out um, from NIH, this is from Luigi Notarangelo's group. And what they've done is they have looked to see what happens over the course of about a year with the interferon alpha patients. And the ones who have the, the interferon alpha uh, blocking antibodies, the, uh, Jean Laurent's thought uh, there is that these are already present and they're there all the time. But uh, Luigi's data would suggest otherwise. If, if you take patients who have APS1, which is this um, autoimmune immunodeficiency disorder where they make lots of different, uh, they develop lots of different uh, uh, endocrine um, autoimmune diseases. Their antibodies are present all the time. That's the blue ones here. But for those who have SARS-CoV-2, they have high levels early on and they drop. And what's interesting is if you look at the blocking activity of these antibodies, even if you can't detect them anymore by Lumin um, Luminex, they still have blocking activity and that is still detectable. So that tells us that we're gonna have to be um, careful how we interpret some of these data, we're, we're gonna to need to look not just at whether they have the antibodies, 
but the actual functions of the antibodies. So the conclusion here is that we find uh, lots of different autoantibodies, not just the type one interferons, but lots of different anti-cytokine antibodies. Some of these are inducible and these have already been described in lupus, scleroderma, immunodeficiency. They're probably much more common than we ever would have thought. So let me just show a couple more slides and I wanna leave time for questions. Um, when we submitted our paper initially to Nature Communications, uh, one of the editors said, well, what about other infections? And so it took us a while to find these, but what we did was we went back to patients in the ICU at Stanford prior to the pandemic. So these are all pre-pandemic samples. And we asked, are autoantibodies against cytokines much more common? Uh, did they exist even before COVID? And could they be playing a role? And so we screened 170 patients in the ICU. These are all people who were at risk to develop ARDS. So they were pretty sick. Um, we also did healthy control. So we screened all these at one time. After we had the data, then we went back uh, in, into the charts and we figured out who was in the ICU because they had an infection and who was in the ICU for some other reason. So they did not have infection. And what you can see is that the ones without infection didn't have a lot of anti-cytokine antibodies. The healthy control had almost none, but the ones who were in the ICU with infection had a lot of them. And if you just look at this uh, as dot plots, there were uh, seven, um, antibodies that were statistically significantly different between healthy control uh, and the ICU who were infected. So what this tells us is that, um, you know, I don't see ICU patients anymore. I only see outpatients uh, and just at the VA, but it makes me wonder about the patients in the ICU who we saw who, who probably, a subset of them probably had underlying autoimmunity against some of these cytokines that are modulating the response to the infections that they're getting in the ICU. And then the last uh, data slide that I'll show you, we also were able to get a group of uh, patients, a cohort of patients who got uh, influenza. And we had, a um, at the time they hit the emergency room and then approximately day seven and day 28. So we identified, and this was a particular uh, uh, influenza strain that was not particularly pathogenic, um, but this particular subject here had multiple anti-interferon antibodies. Uh, we had antibodies against IL-6 that were naturally occurring interfere on lambda, interfere on gamma. Um, this particular patient ended up getting intubated and almost died. Later on, um, even after partial vaccination, got COVID and almost died. And we found several subjects who had new antibodies against traditional antigens like SRP54, thyroperoxidase, um, pyru pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is associated with primary biliary cirrhosis. So the take-home point here is that it seems likely that multiple different viruses have the ability to trigger these sorts of events. And when you look at patients with PASC, there's already a, a, a nice literature out there of, of um, patients who had influenza with previous um, pandemics who developed a PASC-like illness. And I, I think really suggests that the activation of the immune system and production of autoantibodies may play a role in some of these manifestations. Um, we've created a number of different blocking assays, which are all shown here. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to run as many of these as possible. Um, and then we've shown also in the influenza and the ICU patients, again, lots of these patients have blocking antibodies, um, which would be shown down here. So again, it's not just that they have these antibodies, but they're actually functional antibodies that block binding of the, the um, cytokine to its receptor. This, you can't see at all, and I apologize for that. The take home point to this though is super interesting. And that is that um, four or five of the patients that we saw in the ICU who were infected did not have viral infections. They actually had bacterial infections, yet they had blocking cytokine antibodies. And so um, it may be that this uh, autoimmune, uh, autoantibodies and autoimmunity against secreted proteins might be much more uh, broad than, than COVID and influenza and may even um, be playing a role in bacterial infections and path other pathogens, uh, fungi and so forth. So the conclusions here that uh, antibodies are probably important in a lot of infections, not just viruses. They probably are playing a role in uh, many of these different um, um, related disorders. So PASC, PITS is post-ICU. Um, Post ICU sequela, so essentially uh, PASC in patients who are in an ICU that's well described, POTS and PANS, uh, and then antiphospholipid antibody. Uh, 
So I'm going to leave this as the final slide and, and, um, and then uh, take questions now. So what we don't know, I always like to think about um, not just what I've told you about, but what is it that we still need to answer? So we don't know enough about the prevalence of these. We will be able to answer this question through the recover cohort because we're going to have tens of thousands of carefully collected samples. We don't know if they're transient or permanent. Uh, I, I uh, think a lot of the antibodies that we've observed have been transient. Uh, and many of the ones that are permanent, I think, may have been there already. We don't know if these patients are going to develop autoimmune disease itself. Uh, and that's the, the million dollar question. Um, what's the mechanism? Is it molecular mimicry? Or are they cross reactive? I think there's more to it than just that. And you're probably aware of the recent really nice paper by Bill Robinson's lab here on MS and EBV. And there's lots of EBV data. Jim Heath, I'm sure, presented his EBV data. So I, I think we're going to find that there may be molecular mimicry and cross-reactivity for some of these, but I think that there's going to be uh, other mechanisms that are probably more important. Um, we don't know about the myocarditis, and ultimately, we don't know about the post-acute sequela of, of COVID. And I think there are challenges going to be finding the right antigens to study, because the ones that we're studying, they're, they're fine. But I think that the I, we're, we're, we really need to know what the target antigens are for each of the different subsets of PASC, and right now, we don't know that. So let me stop there and uh, take questions. That, that was a great talk, uh, PJ. We have uh, one question in the, uh, in the Q&A and it says, do the majority of these patients have significant ILD from their COVID-19 and are they correlating with the SSC slash myositis autoantigens? Yeah, it's a super question. We don't, the bottom line is we just don't have enough samples uh, and patients collected yet. Uh, the way that the recover cohort is currently enrolling is um, trying to get, uh, we're try really focused on trying to get patients who are relatively recently infected. It's just this unique opportunity to get people during the Omicron surge. Um, but I think we, what we're then planning on doing is to trying to identify those subsets within recover who have specific manifestations. So those who have really bad brain fog those who have interstitial lung disease, those who have uh, POTS, and then trying to focus on unique antigens for each of those. So that the long-winded answer is we don't know yet, but that, that would be the hypothesis that um, hopefully you can hear me. It says my internet connection, even in my lab office is not good. Um, I think it's an answerable question, but we, don't, we haven't collected enough samples yet to be able to answer, uh, answer it. So, uh, PJ, it, you know, I, I know you seem to infer that, you know, that some of these patients uh, are presenting with new autoantibodies because you didn't detect them in their, you know, sera prior. Um, but then again, there's this idea that prior infection with other viruses or interferon could be leading to this. I mean, uh, so are these, auto and, and also the speed which which they come up within seven days is so impressive, you know, that as, you know, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be too quick for de novo. Yeah. And could these be sort of hiding in, in memory, in memory B cells? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, yeah, hopefully I didn't misrepresent that. These are happening so quickly. There's gotta be a memory response. I don't see another way where that can happen. And, and moreover, when we've gone back and looked really carefully at some of the ones that had a huge increase, many of them had um, antibodies that were above the mean. Sometimes they were maybe two standard deviations above the mean, but not three, which is what you would call positive in a clinical assay. And then they went up dramatically after that. So we think it's pretty likely that um, many of these antigens are, um, it's a memory response. They have pre-existing autoimmunity. I also started off the talk by describing a couple patients here who had full-blown CCP positive rheumatoid arthritis. And we know from lupus and type one diabetes and RA that those patients have antibodies for months or years or even a decade before they develop the actual disease. And so it's very likely that person already had the antibodies, very likely they were gonna go on to develop RA and SARS-CoV-2 just happened to be the trigger that came along at the right time. Okay. So I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I have a, I have a question, um, and maybe it's it, you mentioned it, but 
most of the data I think that you said you were generating was from early in the, the pandemic. I'm wondering if you have data on infections of people who have been vaccinated and does the, does the response look the same or uh, maybe it's not. Yeah, no, yet, that's but. a really, that's a fabulous question. So I, uh, for our vaccine studies, we have done, we participated in Bali's um, study that was the published in Nature where we, we profiled patients there who had, um, who got vaccinated. We didn't see new autoantibodies in those. We've done the same thing in lupus, cystic fibrosis, psoriasis, tumor immunotherapy. We do see a few patients who seem to have new autoantibodies that form. What we have not had a chance to do yet is to look at patients who were infected and then got vaccinated to see what would have happened there. We just, uh, we're working with the autoimmunity centers of excellence and they just Literally, the samples will arrive later today. Uh, have a subgroup of patients who um, some of those did get infected after they had been vaccinated, and some of them even had been boosted. So we will be able to eventually answer that question. I think that's a great question for the recover cohort to be able to try to answer, and it's a challenge for recover, right? Because these patients are some have been vaccinated, some not. Some have been boosted, some not. You have different vaccines. A different virus when they some of them were infected a year ago, so it's a different mm -hmm. strain. It's going to be very hard to study. So I see there's some other questions. Uh, yeah. How much like that? age alone explain? Yeah, age. So age alone, I can tell you for the ICU patients, there was a trend when we looked at ICU patients versus healthy controls, and broke it out based on age. Um, antibodies. It trended towards significance. I can't remember if it was actually significant. So I think age is going to be an important uh, covariate here. And it, and it also may be that they have more, more cells just ready to be triggered. They have, uh, they're, they've been exposed to more things over the course of their, um, their life. Um, the next one is past patients urgently need relief of often debilitating symptoms. What immunomodulators should be um, tested? That's also a super question. I think it, it, um, it really requires us to know more about the subgroups of PASC. PASC is a, it's going, it is very heterogeneous and I'm gonna predict, in fact, uh, Jim Heat's presentation recently, I think nicely outlined that. We're gonna see different subgroups of PASC patients and we're gonna to have to do some pretty deep immunology to understand those subsets and then predict which immunomodulatory agents they may benefit from receiving or not receive. Because um, the other thing would be if you give an immunomodulatory agent you could potentially cause harm. So um, I, think, I think we need to know much more about the underlying mechanisms in PASC uh, and Recover is definitely working on that. And then the next one is, do you have data to support the more autoantibodies are present in vulnerable patients um, with obese, aging, diabetics, or cardiovascular disease? So we do not yet. We definitely look at BMI in um, some of our studies, but the numbers were too small for us to find any statistical significance. Uh, autoantibodies with aging are definitely more common. Um, and there are some data in cardiovascular disease that they're also more common. But again, we're gonna need to have much larger um, group numbers to be able to get statistical significance. Very good question. Okay, um, I think we're getting pretty close to the to the top of the hour. This is really a fantastic talk. Um, do you, I mean, do you see? Do you see? Just one question for me. Do you see uh, anything in terms of are the treatments going to be personalized based on you know the specific an antigens or cytokines that they're reacting with, or or do you see you know? Uh, something more broadly tolerogenic uh, where, where this is, is a, yeah. let's say, pause? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. I, I'm going to predict that for some of the, I, I would say for some of the autoantibodies that might actually be pathogenic, there will be targeted therapies aimed at removing those. Uh, so there are these new FC receptor-based um, um, molecules that are being developed that will actually pull autoantibodies and other antibodies um, out of the serum. You have uh, things like rituximab, um, 
you know, uh, B cell blockers, but that's a pretty big hammer. And you certainly want to be careful using a big sledgehammer like that in somebody who's at risk. So yeah, I, I actually think that for those where the antibodies are going to be shown to be pathogenic, they're blocking, or maybe they're involved in POTS by blocking to a, blocking a G protein couple receptor or activating a G protein couple receptor. I think there will be targeted therapies there. For the ones that might be associated with myositis or lupus or scleroderma, I could see there where things like Plaquenil might be used. I know, you know Plaquenil is very controversial during the whole COVID pandemic, but uh, it's a really good drug for lupus and myositis, um, very clearly works. And there are um, elegant papers showing if you withdraw, the risk of having a lupus flare goes up. So I think that we will come up with some targeted therapies based on which antigens might be recognized. Great. Well, thank you very much. Great talk and wonderful discussion and highly stimulating. And uh, I just want to thank you again. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and thanks for everyone who's been involved, you know, in this, uh, you know, in this series. Uh, Joe and and uh, Josh Fessel, uh, Trey, uh, Courtney, and 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 thanks also to all the attendees and and for your helpful discussion. Thanks again. Yeah, if I could, yeah, if I could just leave one, leave you with one uh, other thing to note, and that is that. The Recover Consortium is about to start its own seminar series. I think the first one is even might even be this week. So that might be something that that uh, you think about for just broadcasting, you know, more broadly. Right. Um, there's huge interest in post-acute sequela and a lot of people suffering, and we're we're going to do the best we can to solve it. Great, thanks. Could you please uh, circulate send us the link for that? Yep, absolutely. Great, great. Thanks. That's great. Excellent. Yeah, it's nice to, to fold right into that. So, uh, yeah, and I'll just add my my thanks again to to Jay uh, PJ. This this was great. Uh, really, really interesting and very very um, clear talk. So, appreciate your time. Appreciate your interest in all that you've been doing. So, thank you very much. Glad you came into the lab when you were. <laughs> you were I'm headed there right. Now. Headed there. Right, <laughs> headed down there right now. In fact, great. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Dale. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.